my dear CBS ladies. I hope you're all doing well. And aren't we enjoying this nice weather? I haven't seen dust in at least 24 hours, so it's been great. Um, anyway, let's let's go ahead and start with this teaching. Um, and, but let me uh, open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we adore you, and we just thank you for your beautiful Holy Word uh, and what you're saying to us and trying to teach us. <coughs> Father, thank you for Jesus who is faithful and true. And I just pray that we each learn what you want us to learn and that we apply your teachings to our lives every day, Father. And I just pray it in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. During the Civil War, when uh, Union General Sherman went through Atlanta towards the sea, through the southern states, he left in the fort just a little handful of men to guard some rations that he brought there. And then this Confederate General Hood got into the outer rear of the fort and he attacked it. The battle raged and raged fearfully. Half the men were either killed or wounded. The general who was in command of the fort, he was wounded seven different times. And when they were about to get ready to run up the white flag and surrender the fort, Sherman got within 15 miles and threw his signal corpse on the mountain. He sent this message. Hold the fort. I am coming. W.T. Sherman. So the message fired up their hearts and they held the fort till reinforcements came. And the fort did not fall to the hands of the enemy. And it is the same for us. We ask, when will Jesus come? How will it end? People have had this major question for years and historians have studied the past, hoping to find a clue to understanding the future, to just to try see what is ahead. But the prophetic word of God shines like a light in a dark place. And that is what we can trust and that is what we can believe. All we have to do is hold the fort because Jesus is coming. Be faithful and persevere. Here, John has written three events that will take place before God, quote, wraps it up. Heaven will rejoice because God has judged his enemies. And then the bride and the lamb is, are ready for the wedding. And then finally, Jesus will return in power to defeat the enemies of God. So in the end, we win. So I've divided up this chapter into three sections. Uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. Praise God for his justice. And then verses 6 through 10. Praise God for the wedding of the lamb and his, and his bride. And then verses 11 through 16. Praise God for the rider on the white horse, the king of kings and the lord of lords. So let's talk about verses 1 through 5. His justice. So John hears the sound of a great multitude in heaven, praising God for his victory over Babylon. His judgment against evil has happened. His vengeance against this great prostitute for killing his servants and saints has come. So when Babylon falls, the command is given in heaven to rejoice over her destruction. And they do rejoice. They rejoice because God has shown his pure and divine justice. The crowd is shouting hallelujah because Babylon is destroyed forever never to be rebuilt. And then the 24 elders and the four creatures fall down and they worship God. They join the chorus saying that everyone who serves God should praise him. So, you know, at graduation, there are different levels of honor bestowed on those who have done a good job. So there is cum laude, magna cum laude, and summa cum laude. In the way of giving praise, there is high praise, higher praise, and highest praise. So your friends can get high praise, and some people who bless you or have been merciful, they may deserve a higher praise. But God is the only one who deserves the summa cum laude of the highest praise. This kind of praise is, is reserved only for him, and we see that in those verses. Um, Deuteronomy 10, 21 says, he is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. 
So all of heaven will sing highest praises to God for the end to the evil and wickedness. Justice has finally come. God alone deserves our praise. And there are so many reasons to give praise to God for his power, for his grace, for his mercy. That God loves us so much that he sent Jesus so we can be with him in the end. We praise him for his creation, his majesty, his love, his holiness, his perfection. For how he blesses us with family and friends and health and safety. That he woke us up this morning. The list of things we should praise God for is just endless. So praise God. Praise God for his justice. So let's move on to verses 6 through 10. Praise God for the wedding of the Lamb and his bride. So then John hears the sound of a great crowd, like rushing waters and, and loud thunder. And it's shouting, Hallelujah! God rules over all and deserves our praise. Finally, the wedding of the Lamb and his bride is about to happen. His bride, the church, has made herself ready. She's wearing fine linen, bright and clean. Fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And then the angel tells John that anyone who gets an invitation to the wedding feast is blessed. They are the believers that belong to Christ's beloved bride, the church. So John is totally overwhelmed at this, and he falls at the feet of the angel and he worships him. But the angel says, do not do it. And he explains that he is just a fellow servant right along with John and the followers of Jesus. The angel tells John to worship God and that the testimony of Jesus is what was prophesied. Speaking of weddings, how many of you watched the greatest wedding of the century, Charles and Diana? The wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer took place in July of 1981 at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, in Britain. So the groom was the heir apparent to the British throne, and the bride was a member of the Spencer family. So it was a traditional uh, Church of England wedding, and they had the Dean of St. Paul presiding and the Archbishop of Canterbury per performing the marriage. A lot of fancy people were there, uh, uh, including people of the royal families, heads of state, members of the families. So after the, you know, the ceremony, we saw him uh, appear on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. And there was a national holiday to celebrate the wedding. You know, the, everybody thought that was the fairy tale wedding. Wedding of the century is watched by 750 million people. But you know what? The couple separated in 1992 and they divorced in 1996 after 15 years of marriage. Okay, not so for the wedding of the, the lamb and his bride. This wedding will be huge. This marriage will last throughout eternity. And this wedding is one that all people who are invited will be blessed forever. This wedding is the culmination of human history. The judgment of the wicked and the wedding of the lamb and his bride, the church. The church will be all of his faithful believers from throughout all of time. And let's think about the contrast of the bride's clothing we read in these verses of pure white linen versus what we read in the chapter before of the scarlet and purple clothes of the prostitute. So think of it as righteousness of saints versus the blood of the saints and evil. Hosea 2 verses 19 through 23 says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. In these verses in Hosea, God declares that we are his people and he is our God forever. These verses contrast with the fall of the prostitute, the contrast the fall of the prostitute with the beauty of the bride so that we can think about how we want to live. Will we choose to live to be the bride, not the prostitute? We must live as the church and not as the world lives. John wants to remind his readers to live for the church and not for the world, for righteousness, 
righteousness and not for evil, to live for Jesus and not for Satan. So just imagine being clothed in all your righteous deeds. What a wedding dress. The very dress of the church will have all of her beautiful and righteous deeds for everyone to see. Praise God, praise God for the wedding of the Lamb and His bride. So let's move to the third division, verses 11 through 16. We're talking about the rider on the white horse, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <clears throat> so John's vision shifts, heaven opens, and then Jesus appears. His eyes are flaming and he's wearing many crowns. Now he's not a lamb this time. He's a victorious warrior on a white horse. So Jesus came first as the sacrificial lamb, bringing forgiveness. But he will return as conqueror and king to bring judgment. So the battle lines have been drawn between God and evil. The world is just waiting for faithful and true Jesus to ride into the battle. And so there is a name written on him that no one knows. No single name can say everything that he is. And he is wearing a robe dipped in blood, which shows the fury of God's wrath. And he is called the word of God, for he is the greatest revelation of Father God. A heavenly army follows him, and they are all riding white horses, and they are all dressed in white linen, fine linen. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule the world. On his robe, he has written that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I read this story. Billy Graham appeared on the Johnny Carson's show, and uh, he had a rebuttal to Johnny Carson about the second coming of Christ. Several years ago, Johnny Carson had Billy Graham as a guest on his show. At one point, there was a lull in the conversation, and Johnny said, you know what, Billy? I bet if Jesus ever came back to earth, I bet we'd do him in again. And Billy Graham le leaned forward in his seat and he said, In the Bible, we read that Jesus predicted that he would return to earth again. But the first time he came in love, the next time he'll come in power and no one will do him in. Oh, I love that. So the battle lines have been drawn and the greatest confrontation of all history is about to start. Jesus is coming back. Can you even imagine being one of the warriors on the white horse following Jesus into battle? What an amazing sight. Can you even imagine being part of this, of this huge army? And the good part is, is that we know that God's mighty army is going to win the battle. These days, uh, teaching about God's love and his tolerance have begun, begun, become so predominant that we never talk about God's judgment. It's kind of unknown and uneven thinkable. I think revelation is a good warning for us against sin and evil. Teaching about God's wrath may be watered down these days, but God's wrath is real. And it will be terrible for everyone who denies him. The Bible emphasizes both God's love and mercy and his righteous judgment. 2 Chronicles 20, 17 says, Stand firm, hold your position, hold the fort, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. Oh, I love that verse. Praise God. Praise God for the rider on the white horse, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I really have loved this lesson. I found uh, that Charles Spurgeon said this about this chapter in Revelation, and it really just gave me chill bumps. He said, Climb ye up to heaven, and behold the snow-white host, glittering like the sun in spotless purity. I asked them, Whence came they? The reply is that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It is most true that Jesus saves his people from their sins. Earth knows it. 
Hell howls at it, and heaven chants it. Time has seen it, and e eternity shall reveal it. There is none like Jesus in saving power. All glory be to him. When he shall come from heaven with a shout, and all his hosts shall be with him. When the day of the supper of the Lamb shall come, and the bride hath made herself ready, and she that is the queen all glorious within, wearing her raiment of wrought gold, shall sit down at the table of God with her glorious husband. Then shall it be seen that he has saved his church, his people, from their sins. Oh, I love that. Praise God for saving us from our sins. So we see in this lesson that there is great rejoicing in heaven. God is praised for his justice. He's praised for the wedding of the lamb and for the, ride, the king of kings riding to battle. All glory and praise be to God and to the lamb. So tonight, will you choose to praise God for his justice, the wedding of the lamb and the bride, and that Jesus will defeat his enemies? I pray so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy of our praise and our adoration, Father. All glory belongs to you. Thank you for this lesson in Revelation. Thank you for your wisdom, your mercy, your justice, and your promise that we will all be with you someday. I pray, Father, for each lady here and her family. I just ask you to guide us and protect us in the coming days. And Father, please keep us in your will and in your ways. And I pray everything in the mighty and the powerful and the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, ladies, never forget. God loves you so much. I love you too. Jesus loves you. Uh, so, love you, bye.